All right, hi everybody, I'm Zach Baum, and I'd like to uh, take the time to introduce my dad, Michael Baum. Um, over the course of 25 years, my dad has started six companies, uh, five were ac acquisitions, and the most recent one, Splunk, went public last year. Um, his companies have created over 3,000 jobs and over half a billion dollars in shareholder value. My dad's new startup, Founder.org, is working with colleges and universities to support innovation and entrepreneurship programs to help student entrepreneurs build high-impact companies. Now, without a further ado, I welcome Michael Baum to the stage. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Zach, for that nice introduction. In the spirit of full youth employment, I think uh, Heather's being misplaced here by Zach, but that's part of what we're set out to do at founder.org is we're very concerned about youth unemployment, which is one of the things I'm gonna talk to you about today and, and what founder.org is doing about it. Um, you know, one of the great things about being an entrepreneur is it gives you a voice. And one of the great things about being a successful entrepreneur after 25 years um, is it gives you a really big voice and the opportunity to talk to crowds like here at the International Startup Festival about entrepreneurship, um, global trends in the world, and not just a way of giving back, which is what we're trying to do at founder.org now, but also a way of helping this next generation have their own voice um, by being successful entrepreneurs. And in the end of the day, that's what this festival is really all about, and that's what we're all about at founder.org. So I want to start off by talking about, we get the slides up on the screen? The tech guys are sleeping back there. We need the slides up on the screen? <laughs> all right, great. How about the other one? There we go. I want to start off by talking about um, a, a gentleman that foresaw a lot of this about seven or eight years ago. Uh, Thomas Freeman published a book actually in 2005 called The World is Flat. How many people have read this book? Okay, good. Well, for me, it's one of the most important readings of my life as an entrepreneur, as a venture capitalist now, and as a company builder because what Freeman really foresaw was the elimination of so many of the geographic, political, economic boundaries around the world that are creating opportunities for entrepreneurs. The title is really a metaphor for this level playing field that Freeman foresaw. And it's a great book about really this whole first phase of the 21st century and all the rapid change that is taking place. And perhaps that's the most important lesson of the book, that the extent to which individuals companies, countries embrace this change, this flattening of the world, will really determine future outcomes uh, in a big, big way. So in his book, Freeman talks about the 10 top flatteners, as he calls them. And he starts off in 1989 with the fall of communism, uh, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, of course, where people on one side of the wall were now invited really into the economic prosperity of the whole rest of the world for the first time in their lives. And he goes on to talk about how this was really the beginning of a whole series of innovative changes that changed the whole commerce landscape around the world. He talked about the web. If you remember, um, Netscape uh, went public. Everybody had the ability now to publish things on the web, view content on the web. It was no longer something just for a bunch of geeks. It was for everyday people. Um, Following that, he talks about software. So software is really this encompassing term that we use today to mean how is it that we all work? How is it that information flows? I mean, if you think about how easy it is today to collaborate with people around the world compared to what it used to be even just 10 or 15 years ago, sitting here somewhere in the audience is uh, Pierka uh, Volkovic. Pierka is our head of tech for founder.org. He lives in Zagreb, Croatia. Well, in fact, 
today is the first time we've ever met. We've been working together for over a year online, building all of the technology for our organization. We've never been met in person. Imagine doing that 10 or 15 years ago. It would have been impossible. All of the other flatteners that Freeman mentions really fall out of this concept of software. So the notion of supply chaining, uh, somebody like Walmart who really, if you look at their business, it's a river of integrated processes around sourcing, building, and selling products. Um, he talks about insourcing, the notion of a company like a UPS who actually repairs computers for Toshiba here in Canada and in the, UPS, and in the US in UPS hubs, UPS people doing Toshiba computer repair on behalf of warranties for Toshiba customers. He talks about outsourcing, um, informing the ability that all of us have today to jump on Google and find anything out about anybody at a moment's notice. And with new companies uh, like Michael's Social Radar you heard about yesterday, soon to pull social information into really our real-time view of just walking down the street, meeting somebody for the first time, and knowing everything about them that's published online. He talks about mobile as the final concept and really the steroid on top of all of this flattening of the world, where mobile just makes this accessible anywhere, anytime, instantaneously. So you can imagine with all of these trends, we're looking at a really different world in the 21st century than we were uh, even in the last you know, 10 or 20 years. So if things are changing and becoming so flat and there's all this power and opportunity, why is it that economic growth today is not booming? Why is economic growth in the world actually reasonably flat? If you look at the last couple of years, we're stuck in this kind of half a percent to 2% growth rate in high-income developed countries around the world. Now, you could blame this on the economic collapse, the financial crisis, but I think there's something much bigger going on here. You know, innovation and entrepreneurship is really a function of creativity and infrastructure, two really powerful ingredients that you need for innovation and entrepreneurship. If you look at a country like India today, which has gone from 12% growth to 6% growth in just the last couple of years, why is that? Well, there's huge creativity in India, but what you don't have in India is infrastructure. The lack of political will to invest in the infrastructure has really put a damper on entrepreneurship and thus on growth in the economy. In China, you have exactly the opposite phenomenon taking place. You have all the infrastructure in the world. For anybody that was there for the Olympics, and you got a glimpse of the incredible infrastructure that exists in China. But the Chinese political system and the political will there is to really stifle creativity, stifle one's own voice, and thus stifle entrepreneurship and economic growth. So you see growth really starting to slow down now in China, now that the Chinese are not pumping so much money into the economy in the form of stimulus. So these are you know, pretty powerful trends. The two largest economies in the world, along with the United States, it's three largest economies in the world, stuck in this kind of slow growth rate, growth slowing down. Every quarter, we're reforecasting growth again downwards. It's, it's a pretty dire situation. But unfortunately, the biggest consequence of all of this is global youth unemployment. This is the global time bomb that is ticking away that I feel none of us are paying enough attention to. Around the world today, in almost any country you look at, youth unemployment is twice the level of adult unemployment today. So let's just take a couple look, look at a couple of different statistics. In Spain, this data is about two years out of date from the OECD. I'm waiting for them to publish a new report. In Spain, just in two years, we've gone from 42% youth unemployment to 55% youth unemployment. In countries like Sweden, where you wouldn't really imagine, the youth unemployment rate today is four times the adult unemployment rate in Sweden. And in countries like Canada and the United States, we're still at a 15, 16% youth unemployment rate. These are kids 15 to 25 years old. These are people looking for full-time work who are not enrolled in a full-time school program. So this doesn't include all the students in school that are looking for part-time jobs. This is a really big deal. In the US alone, 
We have 14 million youth that are looking for full-time employment that can't find it. That's the size of New York City. So when you start to think about this, and you start to think about, well, what happens when young people can't get jobs? They don't get married. They can't start families. They can't contribute to the communities in a positive way. Social unrest. There are a lot of dire consequences from this time bomb that's ticking out there around the world. And there aren't a lot of people paying attention to this. In fact, the people in this category that can find jobs today are finding jobs at lower wages. They're not able to be employed in the field that they studied in school. 54% of university graduates in the United States today are unemployed or underemployed, meaning they cannot find a job in the field that they studied in school. This is the highest rate in 11 years and over a decade. So, what do we do about this? Well, everybody that here is here at the festival has a role in solving this problem because there is hope for this problem. Innovation is creating jobs. If you just take a, a look at the microcosm of where I'm from, Silicon Valley, look at this chart. Day zero for the economy was December 2007. Everybody remember that? Pretty dire times, right? Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped from 12,500 down to 6,800, right? I mean, like the world was coming to an end, a lot of people thought. It's a pretty dire situation. Well, if you look at the economic growth and the employment growth in highly innovative, highly entrepreneurial regions since that time, this chart does a good job at, at showing us what's happened. In the United States overall, we've had negative job growth. In the state of California overall, we've had negative 1.9% job growth. But in San Francisco County, we've had 6.9% positive job growth. In Santa Clara County, the heart of Silicon Valley, we've had over 4% positive job growth. In fact, if you look at innovative areas in the United States, Palo Alto, California, Austin, Texas, Seattle, Washington, the unemployment rates today are almost half of what they are in the U.S. overall. This is strong, strong proof that what we're all doing here, innovating, starting companies, is really the key to solving the unemployment problem, solving the growth problem that we are facing as a, as a world, as a world community. In fact, and a lot of you are gonna shake your heads at these next couple of slides, in the last 20, 30 years in the United States, almost all net new jobs, meaning jobs are being created, jobs are being destroyed every day, have been created by companies, young companies, startups, less than five years old. So you might think the big companies, the Unilevers, the Procter & Gamble's, the Goldman Sachs of the world are the ones that are creating jobs. No, in fact, it's completely the opposite. 25 years of U.S. Bureau of Labor statistics prove and people like the Kauffman Foundation have, have taken all this data and crunched on it for decades, have proven that it's the young companies creating the jobs. So let's dig into this a little bit further. If you look at this chart, this is a chart from the U.S. BLS that shows the entire, which is the blue bar, jobs that have been created year by year in the U.S. The green bar are the number of jobs that startups have created, companies one to five years old. The red bar represents how many new jobs we would have created in the country if you subtract the startups from the rest of the economy. Now you look at this chart, there's a lot of red below the line. In fact, only in eight of the last 28 years would we have seen positive net job growth in the US without startups. Pretty amazing stuff, right? Yeah? So, how do we spawn more young, innovative companies? That's the question. Well, I would argue as an industry, we're kind of going about it in the wrong way. We're creating incubators and accelerators, and venture capitalists are targeting people that are already out in industry, have some experience in one domain or another. I would argue that if we're really going to attack this problem at the core, we have to work backwards into the educational system to teach people 
about entrepreneurship to help people start successful companies right out of school, right out of university, someday right out of high school, and someday we even need to teach kids about entrepreneurial thinking all the way down, I would argue, into middle school. My son, Zach, who was up here earlier, is in seventh grade, going into eighth grade. He's at a great school in the United States, but when I look at the in-the-box thinking that these kids are doing at the age of 13 or 14, it's really discouraging. It's not gonna teach them how to create their own job when they graduate college. It's teaching them to look for a job that somebody else will provide them. Well, as you can th see through the statistics, guys like Zach don't wanna rely on other people giving them a job. They're gonna have to go out and create their own opportunity. That's the new flat world. That's what Friedman was trying to tell us back in 2005. So, this is our focus at founder.org, is to go back into the educational system and help kids be more successful at starting companies. Which makes a lot of sense if you think about it, because innovation is going faster and faster. Who understands technology better than the older generation today, the younger generation? Right? I mean, my kids understand more about iOS and mobile devices than I do. And I'm in the technology industry. So let's take a look at the student, what I call the student startup funnel. What's actually happening today in the US? Someday I would love to have this data for Canada, for international countries. Today I only have it for the US. Last year there were about 2.7 million bachelor's, undergraduate, and PhD degrees awarded in the United States. If you take all of those students and you funnel them, we find that about 1% of those students focused on an entrepreneurial activity, 1% of 2.7 million. Assuming about three founders per company, that yields 9,100 startups last year, started by graduating students from US universities. Using a Silicon Valley model of one in 10 companies survives, which has been pretty true over the last 40 years. We've got about 910 companies coming out of universities in the US today that are high impact surviving startups, meaning they make that six to 10 year journey, eventually get acquired or go public and go on to be an even a bigger company. Well, we kind of took this one step further in our analysis and we said, let's take that Silicon Valley model. Let's look at 10 years of student startups, because students didn't just start companies this last year, they've been starting them for 10 or 20 or 30 years, this has been going on for a while. Assume an average six year lifespan per company, assume 90% of these companies get acquired, 10% go public. How many jobs would these student companies be creating? Well, in our model today, about 400,000 jobs are created every year in the US as a function of student startup companies, meaning students graduating, starting their own companies. That's about 35,000 jobs per month. So what does that mean to the whole economy? Well, last month, June of 2013, the US economy added 195,000 jobs. That's 18% of the net new jobs last month in the US. Pretty amazing stuff, right? Well, what if we could double or triple that number? What if we could get 3%, 4%, 5% of kids graduating from school starting companies? Why not, right? That's what we're trying to do at founder.org. So founder.org is a, a foundation that we set up in our family a year ago. Um, we're setting out to do three things. One, support schools support incubators, innovation and entrepreneurial curriculums, business competitions in universities and colleges today. Two, we run an annual competition called the 100K. This last year, we had over 600 entries from our partner schools. Last month, we awarded 10 $100,000 grants, one to each one of those companies. And three, we've created a founder acceleration program we take all 10 of those companies, every one of the founders on the team, we put them into a 12-month founder acceleration program that I'll tell you a little bit about. 
to help get them from zero to 60 in that first 12 months out of school. It's a pretty lonely time. You graduate from school. If you're lucky enough to have a job, you're turning down the job to start a company. You've got fifty dollars to $100,000 in student loan debt. All your friends and your family are telling you you're crazy, and you're going to start a company. So we're there to help these teams that we think have the ability to be really high-impact companies. So these are the eight schools that we've worked with over the last year. Carnegie Mellon, Harvard, MIT, NYU, Stanford, Berkeley, Wharton University of Pennsylvania, and University of Texas at Austin. With each one of these schools, we support a multiple, multitude of different programs at the schools. For example, at Berkeley, we support Skydeck, which is their university-wide accelerator incubator. And two of our top 10 companies this year that won the grants came from Skydeck. At Stanford, we support Stardex, the student-run incubator accelerator. At MIT, we support their own business plan competition. We had three companies out of that competition in our final 10 that won our awards this year. So we're trying to highly integrate ourselves with the programs the schools are already running. Because every one of these schools knows they've got to run like hell to get more focused on entrepreneurship and innovation. They see it in the placement statistics with the kids graduating every year. They know this is where the job creation is coming from, but they don't know how to do it. So we're trying to help them with people that have been there. That's what I said at the beginning. When you've been a successful entrepreneur, you've started multiple companies, you've taken one or more public, you've gone through that whole experience, you really have a great vantage point in the rearview mirror about what it takes to create a high-impact company. So what we're trying to do is bring that back to the schools and help them learn more quickly. So I mentioned we just finished our 2013 competition. We ran it from February through the end of May. We had almost 600 entries from the eight schools. We did 300 plus live presentations on campus between the eight schools with the student teams. And out of that came 50 semifinalists and 10 of the finalists. And I'll tell you, it was really hard to get to the 10. There are some amazing things that are going on inside of US universities. So how do we decide? We had to build our own methodologies. You can imagine cranking through that many opportunities in that short a period of time. It's something not even the best venture capitalists and angel investors are used to doing. This is on a whole nother level, a whole nother velocity. We built a methodology based on what I've done in my own startups, what I look at as a venture capitalist in industry today. I'm a partner in a venture firm in Silicon Valley. We came up with eight dimensions. How, how cool was the idea? How credible, how diversified, keyword diversified, is the founding team? How big is the market? Big market is important. Let me tell you why. When you focus as a startup on a big market, you know, the, the traditional thinking is always, well, you've got these large competitors that you're going up against. How can you do that as a startup? I will tell you, as a startup company, my last company, Splunk, focused on the systems management software market, a $50 billion market. We were a nascent startup. We were competing with IBM, Computer Associates, big companies, Hewlett Packard. The best place to be as a startup is in a really big market with really big, really slow, really dumb competitors, because you can run circles around them with your product, with your business model. We went to market with a free download business model in the infrastructure software space, which was never heard of before. And today, Splunk is a thriving company. We employ over 1,000 people. Through our ecosystem, we've created probably almost 3,000 jobs now. And we've got a $5.5 billion market cap, most successful IPO last year. So all of that, we've put back into understanding that big market is really important. Other things that are important, having a really great product vision. How are you going to build something that's simple, yet solves a complex problem? That's disruption. We also focus on what kind of a competitive advantage you have. Um, we focus on what proof you have. Do you have people that have downloaded the product? We heard a lot about proof yesterday. Um, your roadmap. How well does the founding team understand the way they're going to build a large company over time, not just 
a simple company over time. So here's what we discovered. The red represents our total entrance. The blue represents our semifinalists. The green represents our finalists, our 10 final winners. We discovered three dimensions that were most important. Market, I've talked about that. People, credibility, experience, diversity of that team, and roadmap. How well does that team understand? How much have they thought through their ability and their way they are going to build an impactful company? Now, we heard a lot yesterday about proof. Dave McClure talked a lot about, well, we look for companies that have, you know, 500 million users in 24 months, companies that have, you know, 10 million unique monthly visitors in the first year. We actually don't think that's very important at all. Why? We're focused on big problems. We're not focused on the next mobile social chat, commerce, cloud thing. We're focused on big problems. Let me talk to you about some of these winners in our class of 2013 and the problems that they're solving. First one I want to talk about is a founder at the University of Texas at Austin who's been doing research in their acoustics lab for four years, just finished his PhD, stumbled upon a $10 billion plus market in underwater noise abatement. Turns out that over the last five years, all around the world, there's been an amazing amount of legislation passed around making noise underwater. When you're driving piles to install wind turbines, when you're repairing bridges, when you're operating boating equipment to move objects around, those regulations have created an enormous market where there are no solutions. There are projects in the North Sea of Scotland that have been on hold for nine months at $300 million a month because they can't drive piles to put up new wind turbines because they're making too much noise. They have no solution. Mark saw this opportunity. He was doing research already into the same acoustical wave frequencies of most of the underwater noise and came up with the idea of a bubble curtain. You know that bubble wrap that you wrap packages in? Well, it's kind of a very similar idea. These bubbles are manufactured on site. They're strung together through steel cables. They make them two sides to fit and they hang them around projects or ships or whatever is making the noise underwater and they absorb 99.9% .9 of the abated noise and don't let it get into the environment. This is a $10 billion market today with no competitors. That's a big opportunity. Next company I wanna talk about is out of MIT, a company called Billbacker. How many people here in the room have ever given a political contribution to a candidate? Raise your hand. So we've got like four people out of the room here that raise their hand. How many people would donate volunteer hours or give money to a specific bill in parliament or in Congress if you had the ability to micro-target it? Okay, a lot more hands. That's what Bill Backer is about. They're creating a marketplace to allow individuals to donate volunteer hours or give dollars to specific bills in Congress or Parliament. That's a big idea. That's a disruptive, let's take control back as people, government idea. A company out of Berkeley that's making a digital stethoscope, you go, well, Gee, that sounds pretty simple, right? Well, guess what? 100% of doctors around the world today, whether they're in a third world country or an established country, listen to your heart when you go in for a checkup with an analog stethoscope. These two guys out of Berkeley were part of a mobile technology course in the engineering school and came up with the idea, along with two medical doctors who happened to be their parents, to build a digital stethoscope. They have an iPhone, Android app. They have a small hardware device. They have a cloud service. In that cloud service are the 40,000 known arrhythmias for heart and lung influenza problems and the sounds associated with those at high definition. They compare those arrhythmias to the digital sounds as a doctor is examining a patient and give an instant diagnosis. That's a pretty big idea. 
Another team out of MIT is called Medium. Two women that have created a company that sets out to build a digital canvas technology for displaying high-end art, modern art, old world art, in high definition on any device in full bleed and create a digital marketplace for artwork. Think of what we used to do to consume music 10 years ago before iTunes and how we consume music today. Think of how we all still consume art today, whether it's low end, high end, old world, modern, and the way we'll probably consume it in 10 years. I walked into the MIT Media Lab and saw their project this spring. There was a party going on and nobody knew that the digital displays on the walls, their digital canvases, were actually electronic. Everybody thought they were real pictures. And these were displaying um, new types of art from new artists that are designed only to be displayed online, and old types of world art that are locked up in the vaults of museums like the Louvre, and are just sitting there, the digital rights. These museums aren't doing anything with them. So they're unlocking that full potential. I think that's a really big idea. And I'm not even an art collector. Another team out of the Berkeley Skylab, Pristine. These guys are creating an intelligent product system platform. They're first targeting the market for wine. It turns out about 20% of the wine shipped around the world is destroyed because it's exposed to temperatures that are too high for too long. And a lot of people, they drink the wine and they just think, well, that wasn't really such a great bottle of wine. You can imagine the damage to a brand and to the commerce of a small winemaker in Cote de Bon in the south of Burgundy that has that experience. Well, they only produce 120,000 bottles a year. If 20% of them go bad, guess what? They're losing money that year. So Pristine, what they do is they have a small label. They put it on the side of a bottle. It has three functions to it. It protects the wine from damage through heat and motion. It protects the wine from fraud because Every one of these labels has an NFC chip with a serial number in it, and it provides a way for that winemaker in Cote de Bonne to reach directly out to the consumer drinking their wine to learn more about the wine directly from the winemaker and potentially start buying the wine directly from the winemaker. That guy in Cote de Bonne is probably selling his 2012 um, Pinot today for roughly 12 euros a bottle. You pay 150 euros in a restaurant for it. Where does all that value go? To middlemen that are pushing the wine around. Wouldn't it be great if that winemaker could recoup some of that value by selling to the consumer directly? So that's what Pristine is all about, intelligent product systems. This is a team out of the University of Pennsylvania that has built a new system for keeping kids safe, not just at school online, but also at home. So how many parents do we have in the room? Okay. How many of you have kids that are using iPads, laptops at school? Do you know what they're doing on them? You have no idea, right? You may have a firewall at home or a security service at home or check their iPad when they're at home, but what are they doing when they're at school? Do you know? No, you have no idea. You don't know if they're being cyber bullied. You don't know if people are chasing them uh, as sexual predators, as we found out at my son's school, you have no idea what they're doing. This is a big problem. Every school thinks it's cool to unleash iPads and Android devices on all these students, even down to the middle school level, but they have no way of controlling what these kids are doing online. It's amazing. And the parents have no insight into what the kids are doing online. Securely has set out to solve that problem. I think that's a really big problem and a big opportunity. Jill Jew is from Harvard Business School, and she's really passionate about kids. Turns out that one of the biggest causes of infant death in the United States is SIDS. How many people have heard of SIDS? Jill has a sensor that detects the position that a child is in, their breathing pattern, their heart rate, and alerts a parent if there's a concern for SIDS. Now, it turns out her cloud service and app can also show a parent what's going on with their child when they're with a babysitter, when they're with a nanny, when they're away from the parents. It's this wireless tether back to your child. Um, I think that's a really big market. Just a couple more here. 
This team, Smart Vision Labs, has created an ophthalmology lab in the cloud. What does that mean? They have an optics device that goes on the back of an iPhone or an Android. You can do a full doctor's prescription for glasses or contact lenses just by pointing the device at somebody's eye and using the application. You think about the implications for this in third world countries where kids walk around without reading glasses, not because the glasses are expensive. You can go to Warby Parker and get a pair of glasses for like $20, but the doctor and the prescription is the expensive part. Team out of MIT that's working on micro urban farm appliances, the ability for us to grow our own fruits and vegetables in our offices, in our apartments, using aeroponics, no soil, air and water, hooked up to an iPad through wireless sensor that feeds the plant all the nutrients it needs. You buy the cartridge, you snap it in if you want to grow Australian strawberries or New Zealand kiwis, and everybody can be a green thumb. And lastly, a team out of Stanford that has a hardware device and a cloud service. The hardware device simply clamps onto a power line in any residential or commercial building. It can tell through its sensor and its cloud software every single device that is running on that power network every time it's turned on using analog power signatures. So they can tell on the 19th floor somebody just plugged in a BlackBerry to charge and they know exactly what kind of BlackBerry it is. So talk about the ability now to manage power and turn all those lights off that are on at night that the building is powered up. I mean, I've always wondered, I'm driving through New York City looking at all these buildings with all the lights on, what's going on here? This is a solution to saving energy in those environments. So I mentioned our Founder Skills Acceleration Program. We meet once a quarter with all the teams. We take them through a particular agenda we're having our first meeting coming up for this class in August. We're focused on becoming a high performance founding team together. We complement this with industry mentors. Every month we meet with these teams with different industry mentors to help them on go to market plans, on technology problems, on how do you build an enterprise force. I mean, if you're just graduating from school, you have no idea how to do that. But if you can take a 20 year veteran to give you a quick education, that's going to help accelerate these kids and make them successful. So how can you get involved? Well, if you're a school and you want to talk to us, we are going to be adding some new schools this fall. We hope to add a couple of international schools. Come talk to us. If you are a mentor and you want to get involved with our mentor board, come talk to us. If you are a student at one of our existing schools and you want to talk to us about our 2014 program, come talk to us. If you're a startup here chasing a big idea, keep running like hell and creating jobs and growing the economy. Thank you.